What actually is a number? Do numbers and mathematical objects actually exist? Or are they merely something that has been invented by mankind with no independent existence out there in the real world? Now, there's lots of different philosophical standpoints to take on this, but the one I'm going to discuss is Platonism. So Plato was an ancient Greek philosopher, and you might think that his ideas would be out of date by now. But in fact, a lot of the greatest mathematicians throughout history, and indeed today, are ardent Platonists. So that we can get an intuitive understanding on what Platonism is all about, what we're going to do is look at so-called non-standard proofs of mathematical theorems. Now, normally in maths, we start from what's called first principles. These are a set of the most basic statements imaginable. Things like 1 plus 1 equals 2, or 0 plus 1 equals 1. And we say that a particular theorem or statement in maths is proved if we can start from these first principles, and then, by using nothing but logic, arrive at that statement or theorem. However, what we're going to see is by using so-called picture proofs, we can actually arrive at these theorems in a very different way. And in so doing, we're going to get an insight into what Plato's ideas about mathematical objects and their existence are all about. Uh, plus, it's just a really fun thing to do anyway. So, here we go. For the first picture proof, we're going to look at the sum, labelled s, of the odd integers up to some arbitrary odd integer which we will call 2n-1. If you're wondering why we have chosen 2n-1, it's because an even number must take the form of some integer n multiplied by 2. So to get an odd number, we take 2n and subtract 1. Let's work out this sum by taking it one term at a time. To start with, let's look at just the first term, where we have s is equal to 1. To represent this, we will put a single dot on the screen. Now let's take the first two terms. s is now equal to 1 plus 3, so we have to add three more dots to our original dot. You'll notice that our dots now form a 2 by 2 square. Now we're going to add in the third term, and so we have to add five dots to what we already have. And now we have a 3 by 3 square. And this process will continue with each subsequent term we add. You've probably noticed by now that with each extra term we're building a bigger and bigger square of dots. As an exercise, I'll leave you to think about exactly why that should be for yourself, but really it should be no surprise, with the form of the nth term being 2n minus 1. Suffice to say that when we have n terms in the sequence, our dots will form a square of side length n. Or, to put it another way, the total number of dots, and therefore the sum of the odd integers up to the nth term, is equal to n squared. So here we have used very little maths, and just a picture to arrive at a mathematical result which is certainly unobvious. Now, for our second picture proof, we're going to look at this sum up here. This sum is equal to a quarter plus a sixteenth plus a sixty-fourth plus dot dot dot, and there are an infinite number of terms in this sum. And what this sum actually is, is illustrated by this equation over here. So what we do is, for each term, we take 1 over 4 to the power of n, and for the first term, n equals 1, and then for the second term, n equals 2, and for the third term, n equals 3, and so on and so on, until we have an infinite number of terms. So the first term is equal to 1 over 4 to the power of 1. Now that is just a quarter, right? 1 over 4. The second term is equal to 1 over 4 to the power of 2, and that's equal to a sixteenth. The third term is equal to 1 over 4 to the power of 3, and that's equal to a sixty-fourth and so on and so on, right up the way till we get to n equals infinity. So the infinitieth term in this sequence is equal to 1 over 4 to the power of infinity, and that of course is equal to 0. Now, this is a really unobvious sum, right? It's hard to see how we could solve this, and it's very unobvious what it's going to equal, but let's draw a picture on the blackboard, and then let's see if that sheds any light on it. Right, so, 
This is the picture that is hopefully going to shed light on how we can solve this problem. Now, what I've done here is I've drawn this larger box. Now, this larger box has a side length of one, right? And then what I've done with this larger box is I have bisected it in half, both lengthways and widthways. And I've shaded the bottom right corner. So because the original side length is one, this bottom corner here has a side length of a half, right? Um, so we start off with a square of side one, and this bottom corner now is a square of side length a half. And maybe you can start to see where this is going. So next what I've done is I've taken the top quartile of the original square, and I've bisected it again in the same exact way I did with the original square. So now this top quartile is a square of side length a half, but because I've bisected it again, this lower quartile of the new bisected square has a side length of a quarter. And then I've taken the top quartile of this top quartile here, and I've repeated the process of bisecting it in half. So this blue square here has a side length of 1 over 8. And what we're going to do, theoretically, is repeat this process over and over and over and over again an infinite number of times. And again, maybe you can see where I'm heading. What the question we're now going to ask is, is if we were to sum up all these blue areas we're creating, what is the total area of the blue shaded region? So let's work it out. This um, bottom quarter here, which has a side length of a half, well, what's the area of that? It's a half times a half, or 1 over 4. And then if we go to this second blue square, what's the area of that? Well, it's a quarter times a quarter, or 1 over 16. And then if we go to the next one, it's an eighth times an eighth, or 1 over 64. And what we can see is that this process is exactly equivalent to this sum, because each square we are halving the side length, so we're reducing the area by a factor of a quarter. So all the blue shaded regions, if we were to repeat this process infinitely many times, would equal the exact same thing as this sum up here. And now we have a much easier question to answer, right? What is the area of these blue shaded regions? Well, hopefully, not too much thinking will convince you that that area is equal to 1 over 3. That is, since the area of the original square is 1, and each blue square is effectively taking a third of the area of this L, then the total area of all the blue shaded regions, it can be intuitively seen to be 1 over 3. This third and final example of a picture proof I will leave you to reason through on your own, so feel free to pause the video here and then we can finally get on to talking about Plato. So, now that we've looked at some of these picture proofs, what is Platonism? Well, what Plato says is that mathematical objects like numbers or sums or theorems do actually exist, and they are actually perfectly real. Um, that is, maths is not something that has just been invented by people, but it's something that has an existence independent of us, and independent of human thought. Now, when I say that mathematical objects are real, that's not to say that they are physical, right? They're not physical in the same way that a cat or a tree or a house is physical. I'm not going to go walking in the woods and suddenly trip over the number 73. That's not going to happen. Um, what Plato tells us is that these objects like numbers exist, but they exist outside of space, and so they exist outside of time. They exist in what we might loosely call the mathematical realm. And because maths is real, because these things actually do exist, then what Platonism says is it allows for the idea of an objective mathematical truth. That is, a statement in maths is either true or false simply because it's either true or false. We can't just say a statement is true because we started from first principles and built our way up to it from there. But 
rather Platonism, more than any other definition of what maths is, allows for an endless variety of investigative techniques. We haven't discovered the mathematical realm, we are simply exploring it. And that's the key point here. So just like with uh, the physical world in space and time that we inhabit, we have lots of different ways of learning something new about the physical world. So for example, we can make observations or we can do thought experiments or we can hypothesize and then test our results. Just as we can learn something new about the physical world in a number of different ways. Platonism is similarly liberating for mathematicians. So, in Plato's view, although we can't, we, although the mathematical objects are not physical, we still have some sort of access to them. That is, we can still somewhat grasp and perceive these items by using, well, for want of a better word, the, the mind's eye. And this somewhat explains why we feel like we can intuit certain mathematical things. Like, it explains why we might feel so strongly about the fact that 2 plus 3 equals 5. It's the same way we might feel strongly about the fact that grass is green. It's because, in some sense, we can actually see the objects under discussion. And when we were doing the picture proofs earlier, it may have seemed to you like these proofs are somehow inferior to the more rigorous proofs where we start from first principles and build up from there. And that, although they're pretty pictures, we can't rely on them to actually investigate the mathematical realm. But on a Platonistic standpoint, there is no reason for preferring one method of investigation of the mathematical realm over another. Now, of course, there are serious misgivings about the Platonistic standpoint, and it's been debated for millennia. Um, the, most, the most frequent misgiving is to say, well, if mathematical objects are real but they exist outside of space and they exist outside of time, then how could we possibly have any access to them, right? Everything else we seem to have access to is in space and time, so how could we possibly have access to things that are outside of space and time? And that's a very reasonable question and perhaps the subject of another video. But for now, perhaps we could just say that those pictures we saw, perhaps they're not just pictures. Perhaps they're also, in some sense, windows which will help us see into Plato's mathematical realm.